Hello and welcome to Heartlight Vedic Astrology. Um, this talk I'm going to go through the planet transits um, or um, gochar as we call them in Sanskrit um, for January of 2023. A note first, the information presented here is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical, financial, professional, or life advice of any kind. If you are in need, please contact an appropriate professional for support. And then um, you might take a minute or two to read the rest of this disclaimer. So here's a list of all the dates when planets are shifting and moving in January 2023. So um, January 6th today, that we have a full moon, just actually I think an hour or so ago, um, in Gemini, Gemini or Punarvasu uh, Nakshatra. And also Venus will be entering Shravana Nakshatra today. Um, in a couple days, Saturn goes Sunday. This is a big deal um, because Saturn is the slowest moving planet. And it, mostly when ve in Vedic astrology, we consider the slow moving planets. We consider that more significant. Um, although any, any shift is significant, really. Um, but what that means is that um, Saturn is going into the last degree of Capricorn before it shifts signs, and it only shifts signs every two and a half years. So Saturn's going to destabilize. I'll mention that a little bit more later. Um, and then a few days out, January 12th, we have a few things happening. Mercury's leaving combustion, or Asta in Sanskrit, and Mars is going direct the same day. And then a couple days later, Sun is entering Capricorn, or Makara. And then a couple days later, Venus will shift into Dhanushta Nakshatra. And then the big event, the probably main event for January is going to be on January 17th. Saturn is going to be entering Aquarius or Kumbha. Um, and we'll get into that. Um, the next day, Mercury goes direct. And a few days later, we're going to have a new moon in Capricorn. And if you're following along here, you can see that there's this buildup or party um, starting to build up um, in Capricorn. So that's going to be an important sign for the month. And then um, right after that, just about the same time, actually January 21st through 23rd, Venus and Saturn will be in a planetary war, or Graha Yuda as we um, say in Sanskrit. And in the middle of that, Venus will enter Aquarius. So you're going to actually have this planetary war happening as Venus is crossing signs. So that makes it interesting, a little more interesting <laughs> um, and perhaps confusing even. Um, and then the 26th of January, Saturn is out of Sunday, so it leaves the first degree of Aquarius, so it should start to settle down into Aquarian energy. The next day, Venus enters Shatabisha Nakshatra, and then finally, at the end of the month, on the 30th of Jan, um, Saturn goes Combustor Asta. So, we got a lot to talk about. So, let's talk about the moon first. Um, today, just an hour or so ago, we had a full moon in Gemini, or Purvasu Nakshatra. As always, full moons are considered to be sort of juicy, robust, bright, clear. They have this sort of energy, intuitive, sensuality, creativity. It's a culmination point because the moon is full of energy and light. And things that are full of energy and light tend to um, have more influence um, in the sky. <coughs> And then it's also going to be, so it's in Gemini. Gemini is an air sign. So a lot of thinking might go, be going on, especially since the moon is also a representative or a karaka symbol of the mind. So there's a lot of thoughts probably going on. Excuse me. And not only that, but it's in Punarvasu Nakshatra. The symbol of Punarvasu is a quiver of arrows. So I uh, kind of think about what that might symbolize. Um, the deity of this nakshatra is Aditi, which is related to unbounded freedom. It's a uh, amiable nakshatra, so things like adaptability, understanding, being content with little um, virtuousness, nobility, philosophy, religion, spirituality. Like this is a high-minded um, symbol, yeah, a high-minded nakshatra. 
um, things like yoga, imagination, poetry, resources in general, because again, you have the quiver and you have the arrows. Um, so it's full, right, generally, usually. <laughs> Um, also returning to a resting place, things like travel, so like having a home base and going out and coming back. Um, also recycling, the way that you kind of recycle arrows in a quiver. Penetrating from the sharpness of the point. Thinkers, so again, the sort of piercing quality of the mind. Teachers of self-enhancement, construction, maintenance of buildings. And because again, that, that quiver is like home base, architects and civil engineers. So these are the sorts of things that are um, symbolized by Purnavasu. Yeah. So these sorts of qualities, and especially like the moon, you're going to be like, it's more, it's sort of like party time, really. Like the banquet is there, the people are there, the music is there, you know, it's, it's, it's a lovely energy and especially it's in a lovely nakshatra. Um, might be a little bit dried out again. There's probably a lot of, quite a bit of mental activity going on though because it's in Gemini and it's being aspected by Ge uh, Mercury, which rules Gemini. So it's going to be a Mercury dominated planet at the time of the full moon. Then in a couple weeks, on the other side of things, on the other sort of uh, contrasting energy of the moon, new moon, that's going to be on January 21st. It's going to be in Capricorn, which is an Earth sign. So we're going to kind of come down from the clouds and get real. <laughs> That's going to be an Uttarashada nakshatra. So again, a new moon, because it's there's no light in it, it's eclipsed by the sun, essentially. Um, you know, the moon is not considered in a strong position or strong condition. Um, it's dry. Um, people with new moons can be more sort of timid or suspicious, a bit fragile, confused at times because again, there's not a lot of light in the moon. And but it's a good time, you know, once the moon passes the sun, or right when that happens, it's a good time to start planting, either sowing old seeds, um, you know, sowing things under things that are are no longer um, relevant or supportive and planting new seeds for the new cycle, especially related to the mind. And then the Uttarashada Nakshatra, the symbol of that is elephant tusk. The deity of this is the ten Vishvadevas, or sons of the god of righteousness. So again, you know, a nice nakshatra to be in, a lot of positive energy here. Um, it tends to be more introspective and stable, less aggressive than Purva Shada, which is a nakshatra just before it, but there's a relationship there. There's a lot of similarities, but again, nuances in the energy. Um, so qualities such as honesty, sincerity, respect, um, value, being valued for advice, being a conciliator, um, Ganesha, the uh, elephant-headed uh, deity um, in India, is the remover of obstacles. Um, so this can also indicate like new endeavors, um, if this is well placed, if there's a planet in this next chapter and it's well placed, meaning it's in a um, positive um, house or bhava, and it's in a, especially if it's in a kendra, the four center um, squares or diamonds of a North Indian style chart. Um, you know, this is a very successful uh, nakshatra. Um, also, because it's an elephant tusk, there's a sharpness or penetration, so you can make gains, you know, you can make headway that way. Um, there's a graciousness to it, elegance, well-mannered, high ambition, responsible, and people like hunters and fighters, military, because again, that sharpness, doctors and pioneers can be um, symbolized by this nakshatra. So, um, you know, a different um, energy than Purnavasu, but still high-minded. So even when the moon is um, kind of resetting itself in Capricorn, there's going to be some positive energy coming from it, and positive energy for the next cycle, lunar cycle. So let's take a look at the full moon in Gemini that just happened. And again, this happened in Gemini Mituna, that's the Sanskrit name for Gemini, and it's in Purnavasu Nakshatra. So you can see here, this is a North Indian style chart. The top diamond is considered the rising sign or ascendant sign or the lugna. So all three terms mean the same thing. Um, and what we usually do is when we look, so this chart is basically um, 
the little four, sorry, the little four in the corner means the fourth sign of the zodiac, which is Cancer or Karka in, in Sanskrit. And what, one of the things we start doing when we start analyzing a chart is we start looking at the ascendant because this is the fastest moving aspect of a chart. So the moon moves pretty fast. It moves through each sign every two and a half days or so, but the ascendant changes every two hours. So um, that's why, you know, to do our best to get the most information and most precision out of analyzing a chart, it's best if we have an exact birth time that's been verified by like a birth chart or something like that. In any case, in this case, um, at this moment, we have a full moon um, and Cancer is the rising sign. So the full moon is coming right up <laughs> over the eastern horizon at the time of the full moon, which is interesting. Um, and the moon, the lord of Cancer is the moon. So a lot of lunar energy right now has gone to the 12th house. So you can see here it's gone 12 houses away. And what we do is we, we start at the rising ascendant sign and we count counterclockwise. Um, so 12 houses counterclockwise from the top diamond there is the top right corner where there's a little three. Three indicates the third zodiac sign of Gemini and the moon is there. So what does that mean um, when the moon, when the Lugna Lord or the rising sign Lord has gone to the 12th house? The 12th house indicates um, foreign places. Um, it also indicates um, places of isolation. So places like hospitals, places like prisons, places like temples, ashrams, um, where there's like a limited access to it. Yeah. It's also the house of um, loss and expenditures. So, um, you know, at this moment, there's sort of a collective energy of even though it's a full moon, there's still like this sense of, there might be this sense of isolation or loss um, and maybe processing this loss because directly across from the 12th house in the sixth house, um, Sagittarius, we have the sun and Mercury retrograde. And Mars, which is in the 11th house is aspecting into this, this house. So we have Mars, which is a fire planet and sun, which is a fire planet on Mercury. Mercury is a planet that signifies um, analysis, rational thinking, decision-making, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of fire energy um, being injected or influencing Mercury. And this fiery Mercury is aspecting the moon. So the moon being in Gemini, which is ruled by Mercury, aspected by Mercury, Mercury revved up from all this fire from the Mars and Sun and Mercury being retrograde which gives it strength this is going to be a Mercury dominated moon and um, what I would think from that is that it's going to be even though the moon signifies things like feelings and intuition because the because Mercury so pumped up <laughs> and dominating the moon it's going to be hard to access how you're feeling and, and your intuition it's, um, and it's going to be maybe a rough time to make clear decisions even though there's a lot of mercur mercurial energy um, yeah so what else is um, going on here so the ascendant nakshatra is Ashlesha. the symbol of that is a snake and that typically, very simply, a couple things that Oshlesha can represent are things like drugs and medicine. Um, so yeah, um, it's kind of interesting too. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned, but um, I probably have, that I'm also a physician. And just yesterday, I was in conversation with one of my patients who has decided it was finally time to um, admit um, themselves to an inpatient detox facility for uh, both prescription and recreational drug use. So actually this particular person is very much experiencing this sort of energy where it's like even though the, most, the moon is full and bright and so there's enough intuition coming through to like direct this person in healing direction and again drugs and medicine are involved 
they're basically going to a place of isolation for the next month. So, you know, in a hospital. So it, it, it's, you know, again, this person is a pretty good representation of this sort of energy. Um, let me just check my notes, make sure I'm not missing anything. I talked about Punarvasu. Well, also with the moon, the moon represents women and mom, mo mo mother in particular. And um, that has gone to the 12th house. So it may be that a woman or mo your mom um, might be in a place of isolation and might be um, kind of turning in their mind um, and or you yourself are feeling some sort of loss or expenditure because of mom or mother. Um, there might be some difficulties and you're spending a lot of money or mental energy or emotional energy um, dealing with issues related to that. Um, and then there's more indications that the mind is whirling. That's, that's another thing is in the last few days, most of the patients coming into my office uh, they're coming in for things like anxiety and um, panic attacks and depression because they can't kind of get a hold of their mind. Um, so that's, it can be a difficult situation. Um, anyway, um, we have Mars in the 11th house. It's retrograde, so it's strong. It's aspecting into the fifth house um, of Scorpio, which it rules. So there's going to be a lot of Martian energy um, in the fifth house. The fifth house can, int um, can represent the intellect, among other things. So, and Mars is a fiery planet, <laughs> um, a lot of energy, but it's erratic. Um, it's going to have some strength because it's retrograde. Um, it's going to be in its own house, which, which helps a bit to get the most, the best side of Mars. Um, but Scorpio is like a, it's a deep energy. Um, it's a little, it's a hidden energy uh, because it kind of represent like hidden places and like caves and stuff like that because it's it's the lord scorpio is the sign for the eighth house of the natural zodiac or the natural um, um horoscope for the world if you start with aries at the top um so there's going to be this um drive intellectually but again it, it may not it might be kind of like falling you might feel like mentally you're kind of going down the rabbit hole <laughs> um, even though once you go down the rabbit hole there's potentially innovation because Mars represents you know pioneering spirit and Scorpio represents kind of deep psychology um, so once things start to shift and we'll see through the month that these planets are going to shift once you go down the rabbit hole and you kind of dive deep into your own psychology um, probably come back with some um, insights that would be helpful moving forward. Uh, let's see here. What else is going on in this chart? Um, we have Saturn and Venus in the seventh house. So Saturn is in, in its own sign. Um, so that gives that house some strength, but it doesn't protect the people represented by that house and the um, this house, the seventh house, represents a spouse or partner, marriage-like partners, also uh, potentially business partners and in independent business. So Saturn will potentially protect the non-living things in its own sign, so the independent business. But it might, um, Saturn can represent things like anxiety, depression, um, slowness. Um, so there's probably some of that going on in the field of relationships and and or with your spouse or partner, uh, if that's relevant. And we also have Venus in the seventh house, which might sound like a good idea, but when we have Venus in the seventh house, um, so we have the planet representing spouse in the house representing spouse. Again, it initially might think, seem like a good idea, but it's almost like, um, I mentioned this last month, I believe, um, this is a situation we call the Carco Bavanesha, and um, that's when we have the planet representing a person in the house representing the person. And basically, it's it's kind of like, you can kind of think of it like um, there's just too much energy there. So with Saturn being there um, in its own sign, Venus is going to be ruled by Saturn, um, and it's in Capricorn. So like pragmatism, duty, tradition... 
um, Saturn is also in the nakshatra of Dhanushta, which is um, symbolized by a drum. And so that nakshatra is all about kind of rhythms and stuff. So I could see like um, spouse worrying about kind of like normal rhythms in the relationship. Um, it could also be that the normal rhythms of the relationship have, have slowed down or shifted or changed. And so that's causing, um, you know, some anxiety or depression, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other thing is that Saturn is also the ruler of the 11th house in this chart, which is um, indicates deep psychology. So, um, so again, bringing this deep psychology into understanding what's going on probably in relationships. Um, you know, again, the spouse and or business partners are probably most affected here. And the thing is Venus in this chart is ruler of the fourth house of tradition, family line, lineage, mother. Um, so again, mother's coming up here. And it's also ruler of the 11th house, um, which is like clubs, groups, societies, you know, that sort of thing. So um, with this sort of combination, um, part of what the mind might be churning about is, is understanding how family traditions, maybe even mother, friends, and groups and societies, how other relationships affect your more personal one-on-one -on -one, um, romantic relationship or business partners, that sort of thing. Um, so that may be collectively what we're experiencing. Um, Venus, while well, Saturn is in the uh, nakshatra of um, Dhanushta, Venus is in the nakshatra of Shravana. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but Shravana is, um, the symbol of that is the ear. And so it could be that there's like, you know, slowing down to listen when you have Saturn and Dhanushta and, and Venus. You know, you're kind of listening deeply, um, listening for the new rhythm. Um, but these two planets are aspecting directly into the first house of Cancer. Um, and so this kind of stress, whatever the stress is, um, and it would seem to be stressful, um, is going to be affecting the body and the mind because that's what the first house represents. So it could be causing a lot of mental churning, which seems, you know, indicated and it's correlated with other houses and combinations here. But, um... Uh, yeah, but also be creating like physical stress, you know, however that manifests in somebody's body, maybe, um, you know, Saturn represents the nervous system, uh, the neuromuscular system, so they might be feeling like, you know, aches and pains, uh, the first test represents the head, so maybe headaches, that sort of thing. Venus represents um, usually gynecological issues medically, so um, there may be something, I guess if it's long-term chronic stress, you know, that can affect like women's cycles and stuff like that. So that's a possibility. Um, and then just to kind of end this up, we have Rahu, which is kind of the planet representing ambition. Um, that's in the 10th house of uh, business and career. So despite all this mental churning and kind of stress related to relationships and independent business, um, there might be some attempt to just work, work, work and try to drown your, you know, kind of focus on work to get, you know, kind of calm the mind down um, or at least step away from some of these troubles for a while. Yeah, so that looks like the energy of the full moon today. So let's talk about the world of Capricorn or Makara in Sanskrit because that's where a lot of these planets are heading or going to be in for January. Um, so the symbol of Capricorn is the crocodile or a sea creature. Um, sometimes it's translated as dinosaur or shark in English. Um, because, you know, well, the, the relationship with all these things, is, there's a sort of fierceness and also amphibious um, aspect. So some somebody who conquers both land and sea or something that conquers both land and sea, that gets it sort of the ambitious quality of Capricorn. Capricorn is the 10th house of the natural zodiac. The 10th house represents career and fame. So again, there's this other correlative, you know, aspect of Capricorn representing, you know, pretty high ambition. Um, 
And the thing though, if somebody is a Capricorn rising, um, ascendant or love, now again, all three different words are the same thing. Um, Capricorn folks may be unsatisfied with family and roots because of the fourth house. Um, the fourth house in a Capricorn Lugna is Aries, and Saturn, which rules Capricorn, is debilitated in Aries. So there may be some dissatisfaction with um, kind of, you know, the family line or family traditions, that sort of thing. Um, Capricorns may dote um, on children. Um, their fifth house tends to be very strong. Um, there can be gains through property. Um, the reason why is that Mars, which represents, is one of the um, planets that represents property, is exalted in the first house of Capricorn. Um, and is also Lord of the fourth house, which represents property, like immovable assets. Um, and it's also um, Lord of the eleventh house, which is um, gains and income, that sort of thing. So, um, and also Saturn, the Lord of Capricorn, is the other planet that represents property. So when somebody has well-placed Mars and Saturn planets, they tend to do well with property in different ways. Um, let's see. Uh, Capricorns may be on the miserly side um, because, again, uh, the 10th house, so their psychology and outlook, uh, excuse me, the first house, there's general psychology and outlook, uh, general approach to the world, and their second house, um, uh, which represents sort of, um, you know, savings and stuff like that, um, are both ruled by Saturn, so they're going to kind of have, be a tight, a bit tight-fisted with money. Um, they tend to, Capricorn folks tend to be tall and slender, um, and they might have arthritis, they tend towards arthritis because, again, the first house is ruled by Capricorn. Capricorn, um, uh, first house is Capricorn and it's ruled by Saturn, and Saturn is a Vata planet. So that Vata and Ayur, uh, Ayurveda or traditional Indian medicine means sort of a windy quality. So people who are windy tend to be lanky, tall. They can also be really short too, but usually Capricorn and Aquarius folks are tall. Um, and, and lanky thin because Vata people tend to be thin. Um, Capricorn people might be dual minded about spirituality. This is because Jupiter, which is the planet that represents spirituality, is debilitated in Capricorn or the first house. Um, and it happens Jupiter is also lord of the third house and the twelfth house, um, which are both um, considered dushtanas or houses that represent current sorrow and loss. Um, they're considered negative houses. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that when people have major um, planet placements um, in Capricorn, they may be interested in things related to India or other um, older cultures, um, traditional cultures, um, because again, Saturn, Capricorn, it's a very traditional, it's probably, when I think about it, it's probably the most traditional sign, uh, the most sort of steady, solid you know, um, get your ducks in order, you know, get the house, get the car, get the, you know, the, whatever, the retirement plan, <laughs> like, that's kind of, when I think of Capricorn, that's the kind of stuff, you know, and they're, they're just, you know, and because they're Saturn, these folks are ruled by Saturn, they have, they're always about the long game, you know, it's about taking one step after the other, and just working your way, you know, to a top position, like, in a company, or something like that, I mean, they're more likely to, not always, but I, in my mind at least, uh, Capricorn folks are probably more interested in like traditional forms of work, um, you know, solid steady paycheck, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing, and like making their way up the ranks, um, so yeah. So anyway, that's Capricorn, so all these planets moving through Capricorn are going to be um, imbibed by this energy. And then we have Venus here. So let's talk about Venus because Venus is basically Venus is going to be Saturn dominated um, until mid February, I believe, because it's going to be strolling through, you know, 
um, strolling through Capricorn, and then it's going to be strolling through Aquarius, and Saturn is going to be with it, except for a few days in the middle there. So being in Saturn sign with Saturn, Venus is going to be basically very Saturnian in the next, you know, six weeks or so. Anyway, let's talk about Saturn. Um, so today, Venus is entering Shravana Nakshatra. I mentioned briefly, um, the symbol of Shravana is um, three footprints or an ear. I don't think I mentioned what a nakshatra is, if you're not familiar. A nakshatra is a lunar mansion. So the moon goes through the whole zodiac in about 27 and a half days. And on each of those days, it's in a different lunar mansion. So it's kind of like you slice up the sky into um, 27 pieces of pie. Um, to represent the location of the moon over the course of the month or over the course of the lunar cycle. In any case, the deity for Shravana is Vishnu the Preserver and also Saraswati, uh, the goddess of learning and wisdom. So you can imagine there's a lot of virtuous energy coming from Shravana. Um, so things related to Shravana are things like sacred, preserved, oral, orally transmitted knowledge, like Jyotish. <laughs> Um, I, I, um, myself, I actually studied with a professional Vedic astrologer for three years. Um, that's how I gained my knowledge, um, of the subject. Um, so teaching, instruction, kind, charitable, humanistic activities, travels, um, there can be issues with, uh, gait, walking, um, truth, religion, scholars, students, educators, you, you get the story here. Universities, classical studies, languages, news broadcasting, and recording industry. Because again, this is all happening in Saturn. So there's still this like tradition, you know, this is where the tradition and the recording and the maintenance of antiquity, because Saturn represents those things, and then Capricorn is an earth sign. So, in a very tangible, concrete ways, um, you know, maintaining things, especially since Vishnu is a preserver, you know, and Venus is going to be here. So you can imagine with Venus being here and Venus representing the arts, um, in Shravana, um, what comes to mind, like classical music of different kinds, um, what else? I would think like women because venus also re represents women like uh, women's circles or like the traditions handed down through the family through the female line that sort of thing um yeah so venus is going to be in this space for what is it uh, a few days maybe about 10 days here and then on the 16th venus is going to shift into danishta nakshatra so the symbol of Danished as a drum and the deity this is the eight basus. Um, and the energy in this nakshatra is um, you know, excellence, beneficence, wealth, being a property owner, gems, precious metals, charity, leading, you know, leadership, optimism, ambition. So again, you kind of see there's like this mm, there's still this undercurrent of all the sort of Saturnian, Capricornian energy ambition sound music rhythm so again there's we're still talking about um it's like shravana is the hearing and the voice and then the danishta is like the the orchestra supporting you know the hearing the thing that's being downloaded um rhythms um it can be when certain planets are in the sign, um, it can indicate marital, marital discord or sexual difficulties, which again may, if, if you go back to the chart I just looked at for the full moon that's happening today, you know, it's playing out, right? Um, not only by the location of Saturn and Venus in the seventh house and the Karko Bhavanasha situation, but um, once they start moving through Danishta, then things can start getting, you know, wonky. <laughs> um, and then here, medicine and surgery. So we get the sort of medical vibe coming in here, especially with the full moon and the Shlesha. You know, we've, now we've got a few different aspects of the chart looking, you know, kind of pointing at medicine, possibly surgery, that sort of thing. 
um, real estate can be indicated here, par prayers and poetry, like anything that's like sort of rhythm based um, can be like kind of a Damashta type energy. So yeah, so again, the rhythms I could see like the rhythms of these things can start to shift or change um, because Venus is going through this nakshatra and then again Saturn is there most of the time until Saturn shifts signs. Um, or it might seem like Saturn is slowing down the rhythm of, of a relationship or something, but Saturn is moving signs, uh, shifting signs the next day. Excuse me. Um, and then a few days later, Venus is going to be in planetary war with Saturn. So the two, what these two symbols, uh, what these two planets symbolize, are going to be clashing. Um, I'll get more into that later when I talk about Saturn on the other side when I talk about Saturn. And then in the middle of this, Venus is entering Aquarius or Kumba. Um, the symbol of Aquarius is a water vessel. Um, it's an air sign, um, but it's about um, gains, like resources, that sort of thing. Um, and it, But it's still a Saturnian sign. The thing that was because it's an air sign, it's kind of like Capricorn is like nuts and bolts, you know, step by step, you know, walking steadily but surely um, to make your goal. But because Aquarius is an air sign, like I, you know, it symbolizes things like, of course, symbolizes things like astronomy and astrology and the sky. Like, it's like the rocket takes off, like you drop off the excess um, booster booster uh, jets or something, you know, the booster pack um, so that you can just streamline and head straight up. Um, so whatever's getting reworked here is uh, potentially going to take off towards the end of the month, you know, although the exact nature or structure of that you know to be determined yeah but again most of, again most of the stuff even you know the nice thing so far is that all the um like nakshatras and stuff we talked about like even though things might be slowing down there's still good positive energy here um so you know if you're sensitive to patterns like you might be like hey what's going on but you know again at least Initially, um, you know, if even though things are sh shifting around, um, you know, it looks like it's going to be happening for good, especially because, you know, even though Saturn is in its own sign, it's very strong, um, it's actually generally good that Saturn is in its own sign because that helps to get the best um, aspects of Saturn out of it during this time. So again, we might have, you know, this kind of liftoff energy and also like we're shifting from tradition like Capricorn, Earth sign, that sort of thing to Aquarius, which is innovation like NASA, right? I mean, that's a big shift. So again, something might be taking off at the end of the month once you get past the, you know, once the dust settles from Saturn shifting signs in the planetary war. <clears throat> and then on the 27th of January, Venus enters Shatabisha Nakshatra. So now things start to shift a little bit. Um, the symbol of Shatabisha is an empty circle. The deity of uh, Shatabisha is Varuna, which is uh, considered the god of waters or the ocean. Um, so this sign, okay, now the energy is shifting here. So um, separation, containment, um, hidden things, traps, paralysis, alcohol, solitude, being a visionary, meditative, because again, we're talking about an empty circle. So it's sort of like, you know, is a glass half full, a glass half empty, that's part of it, but also like, um, there's this like stillness, like there's nothing that's like obvious, yeah, drawn in there. So it's sort of like what, what you know, it's, um, um, What's, what is this thing exactly? It's a little bit, you know, abstract, maybe too abstract. Um, um, science, philosophy, mysticism, these sorts of things can come from this because again, all these sorts of activities require some, um, you know, m majorly, um, maybe not entirely, but majorly require a lot of time and space, uh, mental space, maybe physical space as well, to analyze and put the pieces together to come up with, 
um, theories and ideas, that sort of thing. Um, there can be major reversals of business, so that's a possibility when certain planets pass through this nakshatra. Um, and here we go, um, there can be difficult illnesses. Uh, Shatabisha, I believe, when you translate it, um, is translated um, to like a thousand healers. Um, and so it can be like when planets are here, maybe somebody um, has to go to all these different doctors or specialists or something trying to get answers for whatever ails them. That can happen. And with Venus being there, Venus represents the gynecological system, the sexual system uh, for men and women um, and everybody in between. Um, so there may be difficulties with this. Um, I could see where with Saturn being there, Saturn can represent things like structure and you know, muscular disease and that sort of thing. I could see how with Venus and Saturn being in Capricorn and Aquarius, it might be that some people will be discovering, like if, if um, these planets are in the fourth house of somebody's chart, it could be like a diagnosis of breast cancer or something like that. Um, you know, again, everybody's chart's different. You know they're going everybody's going through different planetary periods so and the natal planets you know are stronger weaker that sort of thing so you know again if I say something that's negative <laughs> don't don't let that be a trigger for you I'm just talking you know I'm just talking about astrology generally and just generally um, and again Shatabish also as I mentioned represents things like astronomy and astrology because of the um, sky and can be electricians also but you can see the Shatabisha nakshatra is quite a bit different. So um, if Venus entering there, Venus can also, besides representing the spouse or women, can represent loved ones. So there may be some difficulty with loved ones coming up. Um, but uh, not to leave you in this negative space, but um, once Venus crosses uh, Aquarius, and heads into Pisces, I think the middle of February, um, it's going to be in Pisces, which is where it's exalted. So whatever may be coming up at the end of the month here um, will probably um, ameliorate itself um, um, in a few weeks. Um, although Saturn is going to be in Shatabisha, um, you know, for quite a while because it's slow moving planet, and it won't get there for a while, but you know, it it will be coming. <laughs> so, anyway, so here's a celebrity chart um, because it represents. I pulled this out because it represents some of the things I've talked about so far. So if we look at this chart again, we look at the top diamond first. That's the ascendant, Lugna, rising sign. Um, it's a seven, so the seventh sign of the zodiac is Libra. So this is a Libra rising chart. Um, Libra is ruled by Venus, and Venus has gone to the fourth house here of things like family, tradition, ancestors, property. And the thing, though, is that um, you can see, and I circled Venus here in pink, um, you can see the double arrow though between Venus and Saturn. The reason why is that Saturn, uh, Saturn is in Venus's sign and Venus is in Saturn's sign. So what that means is you can exchange these planets' positions. Um, we call that Parivartana Yoga, um, or exchange of houses. Um, so Venus is when you first look at it in the fourth house, but you can also consider it being the eighth house. The eighth house represents things like. Um, death, chronic disease, bankruptcy, um, other other people's money, that sort of, like, um, most of the things related to the eighth house are considered pretty negative. Um, but, you know, it always depends on your perspective. Actually, things like Jyotish are represent. actually the eighth house is represented by, um, Jyotish is represented by the eighth house. Like, esoteric is also, like, an eighth house thing because it's kind of hidden, Again, I mentioned Scorpio, like the natural eighth house of Zodiac is ruled by Scorpio, which is kind of hidden and, you know, shocking, surprising, like a scorpion sting would be. Um, but there's also a depth and transformation there. So, um, so.
So yeah, so in this chart, Venus is in Danishta. So, you know, uh, the drum, right? The symbol of the drum. And this person, <laughs> since Venus is ruling their chart and Venus is in Danishta, um, you could guess that this person is a musician and they are. And with Venus being in the fourth house of ancestors um, and being Capricorn, you would expect that this person has some some of their music, especially because Venus is also aspecting directly across into the tenth house ruled by Cancer in this chart, which the tenth house represents career. So again, professional musician. Um, there's something very traditional about their music. Well, that's not that's not a hard uh, leap, you know, hard thing to grasp. I don't think. Um, and I also mentioned Shatabisha in this chart. K two is in Shatabisha in Aquarius, um, sitting in the same degree, one degree of Mercury. Um, K two can represent things like hidden illnesses, um, mental illness, uh, viral infections, addictions, that sort of thing medically. And it turns out that this person, oh, and also like um, unusual things like um, gross, like tumors and cancer and stuff like that. It, and the fifth house, uh, if you're looking at this from a medical astrology point of view, represents basically like the kind of the upper part of the abdomen from the diaphragm down to about the belly button or so. Um, sometimes people take the heart because the heart's pretty close. Sometimes the heart can be represented by the fifth house. This person ended up passing away from pancreatic cancer. Um, so again, K2, tumor, Shatabisha, hard to heal, you know, pancreatic cancer is generally considered a pretty hard thing to ameliorate. And it's usually they find it pretty late when it's kind of almost too late to do anything, although they may try. Um, the thing also I notice about this chart, we have four planets. The sun is in Pisces in the sixth house. That's the negative house. Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter in the eighth house. Um, and then with the Parivartana between Venus and Saturn, Venus could also be considered in the 8th house. So basically five out of nine planets are in negative houses. In Jyotish we consider this uh, Valarishta or a, circum or a chart in which there are probably childhood issues or difficulties. Um, sometimes if things are really um, negatively placed and the person is running certain planets, um, it could even mean a um, Balarusha situation might even be that somebody doesn't survive childhood. This person did, um, but they had a lot of childhood, like their mother passed away when they were young. Um, so yeah, it's, and um, their parents were gone, raised by aunts, grandmothers, that sort of thing. Um, so childhood was not easy for this person. Uh, grew up too quick, probably. Um, I think drug use started getting started getting involved in drug use pretty early on. Maybe childhood. I'm not sure about that, but maybe. Um, and then we also have in this chart a Kalasarpa Yoga, which is basically almost all the planets. Usually, all the well, to be strict about it, all the planets will be on one side of the Rahu K2 axis or the other. Um, Venus is there, but you know, give it a couple weeks and it's going to be on the other side. So it may not be technically strictly a color sarpa yoga, but it's color sarpa like or color sarpa ish. Um, and color sarpa um, brings it kind of exacerbates any um, kind of weaknesses in the chart. Um, there's also a lot of drive and ambition. So. So, if you want to know who it is, flip to the next page, or the next uh, slide here. Um, so, in the corner you can see that chart I just went through. This is um, Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul. So, you can see where that Venus linked to, um, and she basically sang um, blues and um, gospel and um, uh, pop. 
pop. But you can see like the gospel singing, traditional music, yeah. Um, and then in the eighth house, the blues. Um, and then a lot of the difficulty she had with her like spouse and growing up, like she just put all that into her music and she did end up passing from pancreatic cancer later on. And this is her birth date if you're interested in that. So anyway, that was my big cliffhanger. <laughs> at least my attempt at it. I'm not very good at it. I'm probably uh, too straightforward. Um, in any case, uh, let's talk about Sun and Mo Mars transits for January. So our two fire planets, this is where a lot of energy is going to be uh, happening, or a lot of activity. So um, not a lot going on, but, you know, they're still shifting a little bit. So January 12th, Mars goes direct. Mars has been in Taurus for a long time, almost six months, except for a month. Uh, it kind of stepped into Gemini and retrograded back into Taurus. So Mars is just revving up, but it's um, it's going direct. It's retrograde now, which gives it some strength, but you might be feeling like you're on repeat, <laughs> trying to get some traction and move forward, but you know things aren't really moving. So they should start moving forward. But it's still going to be in Taurus because it's pretty deep in Taurus. It's going to be in Taurus for, I think, another couple months. I think it shifts to Gemini for good, uh, middle of March or so. Um, so again, Mars and Taurus. Taurus is an Earth sign, and it's also a fixed sign. So there's not, you know, it's, it's almost like this contrast between Mars, which is very, it can be erratic and fiery, but it's kind of stuck in the mud, <laughs> retrograding in Taurus. Um, so you might be feeling like you're spinning your wheels, but you should feel like, um, start to feel like you're moving forward. Um, yeah. And then January 14th, Sun is entering Capricorn. So Sun is going to bring some energy um, into this Capricorn situation. So it's going to join Venus and Saturn, um, bringing some light, some energy to the situation I already mentioned. But Capricorn is an enemy sign uh, because it's ruled by Saturn. Sun and Saturn are enemies. It's also an Earth mutable sign. So the Sun represents also vitality and energy, the way the Sun brings us energy and vitality on Earth. So it will bring some energy also potentially a sense of purpose, ambition, action, and, and again, um, maybe be bringing some light to the practical steps that are needed for the next cycle. So those are our two fire planets meeting. Um, then we have Mercury. I'm like last month, Mercury was all over the place. Mercury is a little bit, you know, um, it's shifting, but probably a little more subtle. Um, January 12th, Mars leaves, or excuse me, Mercury leaves combustion or Asta. So combustion means, and I went through this quite a bit in the last talk last month, so if you're interested in it, you can like check out those slides um, from last month. But um, Mercury leaves combustion or Asta. So again, when a planet goes combust, a lot of its qualities go more internal. So that just adds to this whole like mental spinning, you know, picture that I painted with when I was looking at the chart for the full moon that's going on today. Um, and again, Mercury represents things like considering, deciding, reflecting. So you might be feeling like your mind is spinning and you can't really grab a hold of it. Um, and so once it comes out of Asta, once the mercurial energy goes more external, um, January 12th, then the mercurial energy might be shifting into things like communicating and organizing and planning. So actually like doing something about all the thoughts and decisions that were made in the last couple of weeks while it was um, combust. And then on the 18th, Mercury goes direct. So instead of like thinking about the past, analyzing the past, and that sort of thing, you're going to start to have some forward movement like we just saw with Mars. So whatever you've been potentially ruminating or processing, you know, past events over the last few weeks, um, especially with the Sun and Mars on Mercury, um, you might have even gotten like irritated or angry because there was no forward movement. I mean, Mars was retrograding, Mercury's retrograding, but you're like spinning. You're like, Come on, how do I get out of this like mental cycle? <laughs> Maybe um, your thoughts and actions will start to move forward um, and be more future oriented. So that's Mercury. 
So Saturn, okay, so this is a big show um, for January um, because Saturn is the slowest moving planet and because of what it represents and how it shifts energy in people's lives. So we're going to go through all that. So January 8th, in a couple days, Saturn goes Sunday. Sunday is the means a planet is with one degree of changing signs. And because it's shifting from like earth to air, water to fire, whatever, um, it's destabilizing. It's considered a destabilizing position for planets within the first or last degree of a sign. So Saturn is going to start destabilizing. You might already be feeling it. Um, so hold on to your <laughs> hold on to your hats because um, it's it's going to take a little while to stabilize into the new energy of Aquarius at the end of the month. Saturn moves into Aquarius on January 17th. And when it does this, it's going to come, because it's aspecting onto K2 and Libra, K2 and Saturn both represent things like um, separation. Um, you may feel like there's less separation going on in some aspect of your life, whatever, wherever Libra, whatever Libra that house represents in your life. Um, it's also going to come off of Jupiter because it's also aspecting on a Jupiter. So it's been like dimming Jupiter's light. Jupiter's like in its own sign, um, which seems fantastic. But this really strong Saturn in its own sign um, or swa position, we'd say in Sanskrit, um, has been, you know, slowing, dimming, you know, because they're diametrically opposed energies in a lot of ways. Um, Saturn's been dimming Jupiter's light. Um, and Jupiter represents things like wisdom and optimism. So if you're normally pretty, you know, optimistic and, you know, you might have been feeling like, wow, things really feel like a grind, <laughs> you know, um, because of Saturn uh, aspecting so strongly out of Jupiter. So Jupiter will be released um, for a while. Um, and then Jupiter is actually shifting signs into Aries, I believe, mid-April of this year. Uh, so it will go back under, <laughs> it will go back under the, um, um, influence of Saturn. <laughs> so, um, so for a few months you might be feeling like, oh, okay, I'm feeling a little more upbeat. Uh, what else is going on? So it moves into Aquarius. It's going to be aspecting into Aries where Rahu is sitting currently. Um, Saturn is debilitated in Aries, so Saturn might bring, um, you know, especially with Rahu being another um, malevolent sign um, or planet, um, it may be, bring some strong ambition to Aries, but it may not. Um, it may not go as smoothly or as strongly or as full out as you'd like it <laughs> because Saturn's debilitated and it's in Aries, which is ruled by Mars. Um, so there may be a lot of interest in starting things, but it may not go as quickly as you'd like. Mm -hmm. And then also Saturn and Rahu both represent things like foreignness. Um, so whatever Aries represents in your chart, you might, um, it might bring in some foreign influences. Um, but Saturn in Aquarius is uh, what we consider swa in its own sign, so it will protect the non-living things to some degree um, in that sign. So like if Aquarius is in your ninth house, which represents father, um, Saturn will probably bring some difficulty to father, um, but the ninth house also represents things like religion, um, and guru. So it wouldn't protect guru, but religion, um, with Saturn, if, um, Aquarius is your ninth house and Saturn is moving in there, you might start to, um, get really interested in religion. So that's a possibility. But even if the living beings represented by that house are not protected by Saturn entering there, because Saturn is in its own sign, um, Saturn will still act nobly <laughs> or as best as it can, considering it's still a planet that represents things like 
you know, old decay structures, antiquity, um, chronic illness, can be death, loss, despair. I mean, most of the things people aren't really looking forward to. Um, there will be some nobility um, to whatever comes along that um, Saturn brings to this house of Aquarius, whatever it represents in your chart. So um, you probably want to find out um, where Capricorn and Aquarius are in your chart and learn about that. Um, and I have at the end of this talk um, the different houses and some of the major things associated with those houses. So it might give you some indication of how Saturn is going to shift things in your life um, for the next two and a half years. Because Saturn only changes signs every two and a half years. So it's gonna, Saturn's going to be in Aquarius for two and a half years. Um, and then on the 21st to 23rd, I mentioned Saturn's going to be in planetary with Venus. It loses. Um, uh, so it's in a worse position than Venus. Both planets, when they're in war, get kind of beat up. The winning planet is, has a little bit of an upper hand but and stays a little bit stronger, but they're both uh, wiped out uh, quite a bit. So Venus represents things like grace, sociability, art, creativity, sensuality, women, spouse, loved ones, vehicles, also the sexual system. And it's going to be in combat with Saturn, uh, some Saturn um, type issues like death, destruction, isolation, separation, um, old antiquity, tradition, structure, slowness, duty, poverty, anxiety, depression, chronic illness, neuromuscular issue, and dryness. So, you know, you could just kind of take one word from the Venus list and one word from the Saturn list, and I'm sure you could find um, some some aspect of this uh, manifesting in your own life. So it could be something like um, Venus being women, Saturn being um, chronic illness, Saturn being dryness, Venus being sexual system. It could be something like a woman who has some dryness in the sexual system, so um, a chronic disease like endometriosis, for example. It could be, um, because Saturn represents structure, if we're looking at the female system, it could be something like, again, breast tumor, breast cancer, um, that sort of thing. Um, so you can see how that works, yeah. So anyway, um, then a few days later, Saturn leaves Sunday, uh, so it restabilizes once it leaves the first degree of Aquarius. And then a few days later, on the 30th of Jan, um, Saturn goes combust or Asta. So again, it's going to be eclipsed. It's going to be so close to the uh, sun that it basically gets eclipsed. That's what combustion or Asta means. Um, and when it gets eclipsed, the outer qualities of Saturn are not seen, but it goes more internal. So um, the thing, though, too, is when Saturn gets eclipsed, any houses um, that Saturn rules. So as I mentioned, if uh, as an example, if Aquarius is the house of father and um, Saturn gets eclipsed or, or it goes combust, it may be that while Saturn is um, in Asta, um, you may not see your father. Um, like maybe they'll go on a trip or you're going on a trip or something like that. Um, you won't have the external manifestation of your father, you know, potentially for a while. Um, if your Saturn is combust in your chart, then, and let's say that's the same situation, like um, Aquarius, for example, is your ninth house of father. It may be that through your life, you don't actually see your father that much, or maybe that, you know, maybe your father left or something like that. Um, because again, the external manifestation of Saturn um, doesn't happen, but internally, if you have Saturn um, combust in your birth chart, it may be that you're somebody who is about duty, you have ambition, you're about structure, you might be kind of a traditionalist, um, but there may also be issues with like anxiety and depression. Yeah, so that's how that works. So that, those are the Saturn trends. So let's look at the chart when Saturn and Venus are in planetary war. I took this for the moment when Venus and Saturn were right on top of each other. 
um, 0, 38 seconds, no, excuse me, 36 seconds in Aquarius. This is going to happen January 22nd, 1657 Eastern Standard Time. Um, I included this because, interestingly, this also happens to be a Cancer Lugna rising sign. Um, and it's pretty close to when the new moon is happening. So it's almost like an update from the chart. If you go back a few slides when I looked at the chart for the full moon that's happening today on the 6th, um, we can kind of compare because they're both Cancer rising. So we can see how over from the 6th to the 22nd, the energy shifts so again, Cancer, Lugna, rising sign. Um, instead of Ashlesha being the rising sign nakshatra, it's now in Pushami. The symbol of Pushami, <coughs> excuse me, is a cow. And so that has a lot more nurturing, caring, supporting energy than Ashlesha, which is like, you know, it's a snake. So, which can kind of have a biting you know, attacking energy to it, intensity, yeah, so it's a different energy. In this case, instead of the moon going to the 12th house, um, the moon has gone to the 7th house, so the 7th house representing relationships and business, and you can see here, um, the moon is a few degrees past the sun, so the moon is starting to gain energy and light again. So, again, it looks like uh, if this was a person, like a Cancerian uh, rising person, they're going to start looking at relationships and planting new seeds with relationships, potentially with their spouse and business partners. Yeah, which is a very different energy than even a couple weeks ago when Saturn and Venus were in the seventh house from a Cancer rising perspective. What's also nice about this, instead of moon being in the 12th house of loss and expense and isolation, now the moon is in the seventh house, but it's aspecting back into the first house, which gives the first house of personality and, and general health strength. So you're going to find more strength in the mind and body. So if you're feeling out of sorts and you've been spinning because of all the mental activity that I discussed in the full moon chart, um, things should be settling down and kind of gaining some ground, feeling better within yourself, in your own skin. <clears throat> Mars is still aspecting the fifth house, but it's not retrograde. So um, since it's in its own house of Scorpio, there should be some innovative, transformative thinking happening here, but something that's forward moving rather than just sort of like rehashing the past potentially, or kind of spinning wheels. Um, the other thing is that uh, the seventh house lord, um, Saturn, has gone to the eighth house of deep psychology. So, and um, it's there with Venus. S uh, so Saturn is the lord of the seventh house of business partnerships and spouse. And Venus is the lord of the fourth house of traditions, mom, um, and the eleventh house of clubs, groups, and society. So... Um, and now instead of being in Capricorn or kind of more earthly traditional energy, now you're in Aquarius or, or, or air sign and innovation, you can see how, um, this setup now also with Jupiter aspecting from the ninth house into the first house, um, and Jupiter being in its own sign now, not under the influence of Saturn. Um, although it's Rahu and Saturn are kind of sandwiching it, which does affect it a little bit, but probably not as much as Saturn, you know, really aspecting it from a strong position. Um, I could see how this, in this chart, um, family traditions, friendships, and responsibilities, the rhythms of those, um, instead of considering, like, wondering, like, how are these things clashing now it's like some insights been gained and now it's time to modernize or update um kind of structures and rhythms of life to accommodate potentially like love relationships yeah and so the thing though is that saturn's going to be here for two and a half years <laughs> so i mean venus is going to be here you know for about three weeks so that's great but for a Cancerian over the next two and a half years, Saturn is going to be in the eighth house of deep psychology, um, 
for two and a half years. So it may be also that during this time, um, you know, there's new mental paradigms, you know, that will shift or change. It might also very well be that this person gets really interested in esoterica, um, you know, because that's the eighth house. Um, there can also be issues with um, chronic disease, especially related to like the urinary system, sexual system. Um, and it's aspecting the second house, so savings may dwindle. Um, so yeah, there's those sorts of things. Uh, there's what a Cancerian is going to have to look look at um, in the next couple of years or so. So why is Saturn changing signs significant? Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you can see the cartoon here from Warner Brothers. Uh, Wiley Coyote is like smashed to the floor. <laughs> that's, that's because of, like you know ground down to the floor. Um, a lot of people, when you talk about Saturn and Jyotish or Vedic astrology, they you know really start you know <laughs> getting upset because Saturn you know is, is sort of scary, I guess. Um, it's not a light and fun sign. <laughs> I mean, it's not this planet, I guess that's why. And um, things that most things Saturn represents are not wanted um, by the conscious mind. Um, uh, you know, death, destruction, chronic disease. Most people don't want to sign up for bankruptcy. Most people don't want to sign up for stuff like that. Um, but um, Saturn, just the nature of it, it's all about, you know, decaying old structures. That are no longer needed so even though it can be kind of a slow and um, painful shift or change it's actually necessary for a new growth to happen but it's generally not party time so. um so anyway the in this cartoon like wild Lake coyote has just been steamrolled to the floor and it can feel like that um when saturn's an important sign or uh, planet for you or planetary period or whatever um so houses touched by saturn are restructured so again when you look at your own chart and you look at where aquarius is um in your chart aquarius whatever aquarius represents in your chart will be restructured in like two and a half years and then you want to look three houses away to aries and then you want to look seven houses away to leo and then 10 houses away to Scorpio. So Aquarius, Aries, Leo, Scorpio, I think I did that right. Those four signs are all going to be touched by the aspects of Saturn. So those are the houses that are going to shift the most over the next two and a half years for everybody. Um, so think about that. Um, so one thing that happens with Saturn that's important is a Saturn return. So what a Saturn return is, is basically the Saturn goes back to its natal position and Saturn takes 29 years to go around the whole zodiac. So basically Saturn will reform its natal position at about 29 years of age and 29 years later and 29 years later. So basically the ages of 29, 58, and 87, during those time periods usually people go through like a pretty massive change in their life and they'll see themselves going in a new direction that may not have been anticipated so that's a Saturn return um, and again that lasts about two and a half years when people kind of pivot do some sort of pivot typically um, then there's Sati Sati now this is the big one <laughs> this is when people start like running to the temple and, and, and that sort of thing because it's it's a long haul <laughs> Um, and so what Sati Sati is, is when Saturn is in its in the house before, in and after um, the position of the natal moon. And since Saturn switches signs only two and a half years, every two and a half years, if you if you go through see three signs before, in and after the moon, all together, three times two point five is seven point five. So about seven and a half, you know, years. Um, this is when so many things can happen it's a long period um but one thing that seems to be consistent with everybody is that you'll see major shifts in support systems so typically what might happen is during your first sati sati um you might lose grandparents family support system during the second sati sati you might lose parents 
And during the third sunny sati, if you live that long, you might end up losing yourself. Um, but this can be other things like institutions and stuff like that. Anything that really supported you and was there for you, like you might you might feel like you're, you know, like in a movie. <laughs> That's how I feel at times. That you're in the movie and like you're in the action flick, uh, you know, crossing the bridge or something, and then, um, um, you know, that it's getting bombed behind you, like there's no going back. It can be feel like that at times. The other thing is because Saturn is a vata, you know, wind planet that's very drying, and it's within the range of the moon, which is like, has typically light and it's juicy and that sort of thing. Um, it'll dry out your moon, so, um, and, and influence the moon. So Saturn brings things like anxiety and depression to the moon or the mind. So it's typically a very challenging time mentally um and then saturn also represents you know part of support systems or friends and family um so people are often very alone during sati sati which you know if you can maintain any sense of optimism during sati sati and it's challenging let me tell you um you know there is an opportunity to develop a stronger relationship with yourself and divinity so because other people who are normally around you or not around you um yeah it's also a chance also to develop new support systems for the next 30 years of your life um, because the old structures it's kind of like that saying you know once you cross the river and you're in the desert you don't need the raft anymore so you know every time saturn um, goes through a shift you know like a saturn return or a sati sati i mean that's like a you know, you're really kind of in a whole new phase of life. Um, so general advice um, is that everybody's going to be affected in significant ways. So especially during January, you really want to give the transit and people time and space to settle into new energies. Um, don't take it personally because everybody's going to be dealing with new stuff. Um, for people, um, myself included, who are ending their sati sati <laughs> and like literally counting the days, uh, uh, and not that it's been all bad for me. I'm gonna discuss my own experience with sati sati a little bit in a little bit, but um, just briefly. But um, um, yeah, I mean, in the last few months, once Saturn started going, ended retrograde and started progressing, I have personally felt like. In the last few months my life is opening up again because it was like walking through a desert in a lot of ways um, the last seven and a half or so years um, eight years um, but again some people are going to be going into sati sati other people are continuing through sati sati some people are ending sati sati um, and even people who are not in close or around sati sati like saturn is still shifting signs so new areas of the life are going to be under reconstruction and it's going to shift their priorities and their attention their focus their energy so give yourself some breathing space give other people breathing space you know let planets shift let the dust settle um so that we can all see what the new landscape is that we're dealing with and, you know it's going to take up our time and focus yeah so be patient, be compassionate with self and others, because um, big things are coming. Um, so, um, I was looking for a person's chart. Um, I didn't find a person, but I found um, Ukraine. <laughs> um, so, look at this. So, this is Ukraine chart. Um, they formed their latest version of their government. August 24th, 1991, about 6 o'clock, Kiev uh, time. This is, um, so this is a chart for that moment. And um, you can see Saturn retrograde in Capricorn. Hello. Now you tell me, after all of this talking I've been doing, you can tell me what this means. This is going to be a very pragmatic, very traditional, very ambitious country. Like, that's just the vibe. Yeah, like, even the... Um, hipsters and you know that sort of thing like this is you know there's a lot of pragmatism and drive and you know just nose to the grindstone energy here 
And look, it's with the moon. So Ukraine, the nation of Ukraine, was born in Sarisati. So it was born at a time when um, there was a lot of dryness for the moon. Even though the moon is almost full, um, it's, it's reaching its fullness in a few degrees, um, there's going to be this dryness with the moon. Yeah, for the general sort of, as a general sort of gestalt or personality of it, of Ukraine. So it's not going to be a happy go lucky um, type of nation, um, one would say. Although, um, if you look at the eighth house here, which is represented by Leo, the fifth sign, um, we've got Venus retrograde, so it's a strong Venus. We've got Mercury retrograde, strong Mercury, and we have Jupiter. We have all three benefic planets together with the sun and they're all look venus uh, excuse me mercury and jupiter are right on top of each other the exact degree and second um, so there's going to be a lot of probably intellects here um, but they're all within a few degrees of the sun so they're basically all combust so um how i would see this is that all that, like deep down, like the deep psychology of, of the Ukraine is a very noble-minded um, planet. Like it's it's um, very noble-minded in, in the deeper motivations of the country. Um, and these are all in the nakshatra of Maga. Maga is um, symbolized by a throne. Um, and Maga is also like um, from a Vedic standpoint or point of view is like the star where our ancestors live so there's a, like a very again like another indication of like deep traditional um, thought process here um, but high-minded noble thought process as well so um, and then you can see the little arrow here so Saturn's gonna be shifting into um, Aquarius so the thing though is that um, Basically, Saturn for the last two and a half years has brought Ukraine back into Sati Sati. <laughs> it's also brought it back to its um, Saturn. It's basically at a Saturn return as well. Um, and frankly, this is why the Ukraine's been getting pummel pummeled. Um, you know, in the war with Russia. Um, so um, at least there's some strength here. Um, it's probably because Saturn is in its own sign and super strong. Um, it's probably helped, um, despite the fact that Saturn is what Saturn is. It's still about decay, destruction, losing support systems. Um, yeah, so the fact that Ukraine is still standing is probably, you know, a miracle, frankly. Um, just considering it's a um, much smaller country with less resources than Russia. Um, but at least this is sort of like, again, the national personality gestalt and also like karma, because again, all horoscopes from a Vedic perspective are karma, karma scopes, we call them, yeah. So this is the, you know, so this is, so, but that also means that like, um, since it's going to be another two and a half years, like even though Saturn shifts into Aquarius, it's still another two and a half years before Ukraine finishes Sati Sati. So I, unfortunately, I don't think that the uh, situation is over. Um, it's going to take some more time to uh, maybe see some light at the end of the tunnel. So, uh, unfortunate. Not to be a bummer, um, but, you know, that's kind of Saturnian energy. <laughs> Again, not light and happy and like, woo, you know, so. And then um, I also pulled up uh, Russia's chart because Russia is going through the same thing. Not only is it going through uh, Saturn return, or, um, but it's also going through Sati Sati because, again, these nations were formed pretty, uh, pretty close in time. So this chart is based on June 12, 1990, noon Moscow time. Um, the Lugna here is Leo. Um, and you can see Capricorn is now in the sixth house. Sixth house represents things like daily rhythm and also enemy. <laughs> so, um, but it's also different because um, here the sun has gone to the tenth house of um, kind of career um, and, and fame. 
this chart also has a basically a Kala Sarpa yoga, so it's going to be exaggerated in terms of any sort of um, highs and lows, as well as uh, ambition. Um, and the thing is, you know, because Saturn and Moon are on the sixth eight axis, um, the sixth house also represents enemies, and it seems like, for the most part, most of the world has sort of, you know, sided with Ukraine, you know, and the Ukraine-Russia skirmish here. Well, it's more than a skirmish war. Um, and then also, there's going to be a lot of issues with the 12th house, right? So expenses, losses, foreign things, uh, places. So it's, you know, Russia's been boycotted and a lot of the products coming from Russia. So um, even though Russia, like in the previous slide with the Ukraine, the physical, like with Saturn and Moon being in the first house, being in that being recreated, with both Saturn return and Saudi Satya for the Ukraine, it's changed, literally changed the face of the country because the first house represents physicality. Like when you first look at somebody, like are they tall, are they short, are they blonde, are they redhead or whatever, like your first kind of impression of their personality and physicality is what you get from the first house. And that's been decimated in the Ukraine, not so much in Russia, yeah. But as you see the blue arrow here, um, Saturn is going to shift into the seventh house of the Russian chart, um, which is uh, business partnerships, independent business, um, you know, spouse. It doesn't, you know, really um, is not really relevant in this, as a nation chart, but um, it's going to start aspecting into the first house. Um, and it's also going to aspect in the fourth house of tradition. It's also going to aspect in the ninth house of government. So um, the next two and a half years is not going to be easy for Russia either. And they're now in the next two and a half years, you might just see, see more um, actually destruction possibly um, on Russian soil and or the head, right? Um, so maybe that means Putin, maybe that means other aspects of the Russian government. I wouldn't be surprised if in the next two and a half years we start to see those changes because of, again, this is Russia's chart and where Saturn is heading next for Russia. So again, not light and fluffy, um, but that's Saturn and it does what Saturn does. So. Um, and I mentioned I was just going to say a few words about my own experience with Saturn. So when I went through my Saturn return at the age of 29, I did make a shift, uh, mostly in my career, although I moved also um, cross country. Um, but I switched from doing uh, basic science research to medicine. So I was a bench side research person um, and then decided I wanted to work in clinic with people instead. So that was a big switch uh, for me. Um, and then now, um, in a few days, about 10 days, I'm going to be ending my second Sati Sati. So what's been happening over the last seven and a half years in my life? Um, I did definitely lose support systems, um, but I also developed new ones. So I lost my father. Um, and actually the school where I went to medical school, that is no longer. So my alma mater we call it um, here in the States, um, your other mother, um, you know, because it provides so much support in terms of your training and, you know, nourishment of your mind and career and stuff like that. Um, it no longer exists. And even the people who, um, the dean of the program who was there when I was in school has passed. And the man who started the program has also passed. So it's almost like all these different layers of the school have um, moved on um, and typically during Sati Sati because it's Saturn it's like a lot of work like you know work 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 and not a lot of obvious reward coming back for it um, it's definitely been a struggle in many ways uh, the last seven and a half years um, personally uh, career wise financially it's um, it hasn't been easy um, especially the last three years um, during the pandemic, um, since I was working with patients, I was very, very cautious about um, getting out and about. Um, I really haven't. So I've basically been isolated. So again, very Saturnian. 
I've basically been isolating for three years, and just now, um, as I mentioned, um, in the last few weeks, um, has started because the world is opening up, but I'm behind because, uh, and I'm still not out and about as much as I'd like. I love international travel, but I haven't done that in years. Um, uh, so that sort of thing has slowed down for me. Um, the last three years, I basically have been isolating. I haven't really gone out much, mostly just going out, you know, grocery shopping or doing uh, errands and stuff, but not doing anything social the way I used to. Um, and in many ways, I mentioned um, Sadi Sati has been like walking through the desert. Um, so again, <laughs> I'm I'm actually more of a Jupiterian person myself, <laughs> so you know I'm always trying to like look for the bright side, um, although it's difficult at times. Um, and the other thing is, not only am I going through Sati Sati, but I happen to going be going through a Saturn um, Subdasha, a Saturn Bhukti, so that makes the Saturnian energy even stronger for me the last uh, couple of years. And even though um, my Sati Sati is ending uh, in a couple weeks, like I'm still going to be in Saturn, Subdasha, so um, planetary period for another year and a half. So I don't think I'm completely out of the woods with <laughs> um, even though Sati Sati is ending. Um, but um, despite all this, I have to say uh, my Sati Sati was actually fantastic and magical in other ways and that's a big word magic um, um, when I first entered Sati Sati that's when I basically did additional training in Ayurveda so now I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner so I practice traditional Indian medicine as part of my med medical practice um, I'm a naturopath a naturopathic physician um, and we have many modalities available to us, but um, at least where I practice, there aren't that many naturopathic physicians practicing Ayurveda. So I have that, uh, those, that paradigm and um, tools to offer patients, um, things like marma therapy and nutrition. It's, it's, it's amazing how well that works and how much that has supported um, me, my own physical health, but also my patients. And I also, um, you know, that three years of isolating <laughs> gave me three years to study Jyotish. And so I wouldn't be able to produce uh, transit reports like this um, without that time off um, from, from the rest of the world influencing me. I would also say, too, that um, being so isolated, it's kind of like um, in being an island, um, a personal island. Without having other support systems, you learn how to better support yourself and you learn how to more rely on the divine um, because those, those are the two things that will not change uh, while you're still walking on the planet. Um, other things may change and um, all those other things, relationships and, and money and <clears throat> careers and all that kind of stuff that comes and goes and it changes and it all kind of comes from at least in my mind from source you know divinity nature or whatever name you want to put to it so <clears throat> it's kind of like um, cutting out the middleman so that you can develop a closer more direct relationship with um, you know God the divine um, there was some other thought I had about Oh, and the other thing is that um, also being an island, you become much more clear on what's true and authentic for you rather than, you know, tra trends or fads or what's in the newspaper or what people around you are talking about. Like, you just don't have that influence, and so you can get much more clear within yourself and with yourself um, about what you want your life to be and what directions you want to take it. So um, that's actually been um, good in many ways. So it hasn't all <laughs> been bad, uh, but it's, it's, it's been something, I'll tell you that. So um, in any case, a few words about my own experience. Maybe it'll help you. Um, the other thing that might help you <clears throat> if you are entering Sati Sati, continuing or getting into a Saturn return or something like that, um, 
one I would I would offer you different mantras that um, support Saturn um, there's the simplest one which is Om Shri Shanishwariyai Namaha um, if you want and I have on here listed I actually created another video um, how to chant mantras and I have it on my other channel which is nature source care that's my channel for natural medicine so if you um, haven't ever done a mantra practice that video it's about 20 minutes long I talk about how to create a simple practice and why you might do it and what might happen and stuff like that with kind of nuts and bolts um, you can check that out but if you already have a mantra practice these are the three that I would recommend so Om Shri Shanshwari Namaha so it's sort of like salutations to Shani Shani is um, Saturn in Sanskrit the second one is the Mahamrtun Jaya Mantra it's also known as the Rudra or Triambaka Mantra and this is the Om Triambaka Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Udra Rukamiva Pandana Mrityo Mukshya Mamritat That one, that's the Mahamritan Jaya Mantra. My favorite version of this is sung by Ajit. Um, I will if hopefully remember to link her information in the description box below. Um, she has a whole, I think, 30 minute long um, you know, musical version of this mantra. I love to use it. I mean, I think her music is very ethereal. It automatically, as soon as I hear her voice, it kind of puts me in a different space, much more spiritual minded. Um, and it's nice to have that support, you know, chanting the mantra, it's a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, this mantra is used for Rudra. Rudra is the god of storms and destruction and dissolution, which again is part of what Saturn brings, right? Um, wherever it shines its light, that's its job. I mean, somebody's got to, you know, so, you know, we got to recycle the old stuff, and that's its job. So, um, this is something you can use. This mantra is something you can use to at least take the edge off potentially or shift some of the karma related to Saturn in your chart you know again Saturn is what Saturn is and if there's really strong deep karma with Saturn it's it's going to do what it's going to do I mean you can't chant these mantras so much that it'll you know protect somebody you love from passing away if that's theirs and yours karma but um, it should help to ameliorate some of the negative karma uh, associated with Shani. Um, so anyway, and then the third one here is the Hanuman Chalisa, which is a very long mantra. I'm not going to put the whole thing here, but that's another one uh, because uh, there's a relationship between Saturn and Hanuman, the monkey-faced god. He's sort of like the superhero and the sort of deity panel um, of India. So one of these three mantras or you can switch depending on your mantra practice but uh, often as um, Jyotishis this is sort of um, kind of a paya or remedy we would give somebody to help them when they have difficult karma associated with certain planets um, and I listed again the how to chant mantras video on my other channel that's available to support you other things you can do because Saturn represents things like you know, elder people and the poor, devastation, you know, dirty and actually kind of dirty um, places and stuff like that. So you can also make donations or, or give your time, volunteer um, with charities involved with those things. So anything involved with elders that would support them, creating better lives for them, the poor, homeless, um, places that have been devastated um, by war or natural disasters places that need clean up like the beach or something like that um anything you can do to support those areas is basically driving your karma creating new positive karmas to balance out um negative karmas you might have related to saturn or shani okay so anyway more support for you um as saturn shifts signs and then I mentioned I was going to list um, the houses and general things that they're related to. So again, you want to look for Capricorn and Aquarius in your chart. And then you also want to look at 
three, seven, and ten houses away because those are the aspects of Saturn. So you want to look for, like Capricorn will tell you now, but in a couple of weeks you want to look for Aquarius. And then three houses away from Aquarius is Aries, seven houses away is, is Leo, and then ten houses away is Scorpio. So that's what you want to look for. Um, and then here's a blank chart. So again, the first house is the top diamond. So I think I just pushed the wrong button. Let me start again. So, um, so this is a chart. The first house is um, right at the top, the top diamond, and then you count counter counterclockwise, second, third, and you get to the twelfth. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I'm not going to read through all these because I'm losing my voice. But at least you have, like, the first house is related to self, personality, health, reputation. The seventh house I've talked about a lot today says so spouse, partnerships, independent business. And you can read through the rest. This is, um, you know, again, going by axis. So the first seven, one seven axis, the two eight axis, and the three nine axis. And then on the next slide, you have the four ten axis, um, the 5, 11 axis, the 6, 12 axis. And again, you can read the different things associated. So once you find Aquarius and find out which number house it is, um, then you can look up what's related to that house. And then you can look, you know, figure out three houses away. So add, like, if um, Aquarius is your fifth house, then three houses away is going to be the eighth house. Then you can look at the eighth house things that it's related to and you know and so on and so on right so anyway thank you for your time um i hope you found this uh, useful and interesting as you navigate the upcoming month um again um i'm very grateful to you actually saturn shutting <laughs> because um if it wasn't for Saturn and Shetty, I probably wouldn't have had the time, the um, wherewithal, the motivation to learn Jyotish and then share it with others to support them in their walk of life. So, you know, namaste Shetty. <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing to say. But um, in any case, if you're interested in individual birth chart readings, I do them on Zoom. If you're interested in that, you can email heartlikeastro.yahoo.com. And again, I mentioned I do natural medicine. My other channel um, is called Nature Source Care. And I talk, I do videos on things like Ayurveda, yoga, homeopathy, naturopathic medicine there. So if that's of interest, you can check that as well. Um, but I think that's it. I've been talking a long time. So, um, which is Saturn. <laughs> Saturn is good for endurance. So, um, once again, thank you, Saturn, and thank you to all of you. So, take care until the next one. Namaste.